RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. All right, it's Friday morning already again. And Friday morning is our political panel morning here at Reality Check Radio, our panelists. If I was to beat you guys up, I'd be a panel beater. (laughs) <laughs> right? I would be. Cam Slater, Olivia Pearson, and Marty Gibson, welcome back to RCR. And Can I say what a week it's been? Has it been a week? It's always it's been, been. No, it's been a week and it's been spectacular, and this is why I love election year. There's just uh, cock-ups and missteps and walk-backs, and, and we've seen all of that. And in fact, we've seen so, so much walking back from one particular party. You'd think they're challenging the French at the – um, annual walking backwards or marching backwards competition. <laughs> walking back to happiness. I remember that song. Maybe not. Okay, Olivia, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Paul. Really well. Glad yep. to be here. Yep, glad to have you. And Marty, are you still hanging out at Papa Moa there at yeah, the, in the Florida of New Zealand? The Florida of New Zealand. Yeah, no, I've uh, been some good weather and. Uh, just existing on this high fiber diet of New Zealand media uh, with my various <laughs> responsibilities. It's a lot of off chewing to, the... to get any nutritional value, and if you have too much, it gives you the shits. But um, so I'm, you I'm might take it. You might take a little stop during this. Is that what you say? Oh no, I should be right. Okay, and keep it in for for a bit. Okay, so uh, where do we start? Let's start on the polls. Roy Morgan poll. What's it telling us? Well, we're, what we're seeing is that we've still got a very close race where National and ACT are on 45% and they're just ahead of Labour and Greens on 43%. And um, the, the Maori Party sitting there um, looking like they're uh, kingmakers, but the problem is is they're actually going to only go one way and that's with the uh, communists and the um the slightly less communist Labour Party. So it's a pretty close election still. Um, there's a lot of people who who uh, are saying stupid things like, oh, but the polls are always always wrong. Or, you know, Sure, they give you an indication of where things are heading. Where things are heading is nowhere good at the moment. Um, but the campaign fully hasn't started, so you're not seeing New Zealand First coming through on that just yet because Winston is only just starting to arc up. But, yeah, um, but we, are we getting back on track? That's what I want to know. Well, I think that uh, back on track for the National Party did a, a reverse ferret, oh. or, or or on Wednesday they, um, uh, well, Christopher Luxon um, has not learnt that the media are out to get him. He still thinks they're his friend, and he thinks that just because somebody um, asks him a question, he um, has to answer it. And uh, he hasn't learned to dodge. And they set him up a beauty um, on Wednesday, asking him about um, the cost of prescriptions for for um, contraceptives. And the stupid fool gave this sort of intellectual argument about, well, you know, um, we should be looking at cost effective ways of, you know, making sure that those in need are, are covered. And other, it just ended up with headlines. And the Labour Party sending out press releases that were all bad for Luxon. And I'm sitting there just shaking my head and thinking. So you know, what would be the best way to handle that if if you were him? You just say, look, I, my, I'm not going to answer that. Yeah. Well, Next I, question, please. I mean, I've, How I've does taught, it work? Yeah, I've taught politicians that to answer questions without answering. And it's actually quite easy. What this says, well, that's a, that's a good question that you've got there. But I think at the moment, there's more important things to worry about in New Zealand, like the cost of living, like rampant inflation, out of control government debt, the Reserve Bank doing crazy things with interest rates, um, improper um, spending. We've got a prime minister and uh, and uh, an education minister. I, I think we get it. about everything I, else, right? Other I think than, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about everything else, and he can't do that. He's he's like the David Shearer of the National Party. And he thinks that you, because they ask you a question, you've got to answer what they've asked. Why would they have asked that question anyway? I mean, because it was a setup. I mean, about 10 minutes after he said it, I had an email in my inbox from the Labour Party um, expressing Uh, outrage. It was a setup. The media were prepped on that. They've they've war gamed, the Labour Party's war gamed how to get Luxon. And they've said, well, this is going to be an issue. This is a woman's issue thing. Let's get him. What about free condoms? Well, exactly, but he, he he just doesn't cover those things. He's he can't sniff out a trap, you know, and 
And if he wants to be the prime minister, he needs to be able to sniff out a trap. I mean, he's running out of time and feet to shoot at at the moment. This is no way an issue, Olivia, is it? What we're talking about here? Uh, I mean, it's it's just such small potatoes, but I know that Cam's got Cam's probably correct that it was a setup that he yeah. got asked about a woman's issue and he he, you know, went and admitted that what the women have to pay five dollars for a prescription fee for contraception and one less cheeseburger. Yeah, yeah, one less coffee, and um, it's stuff and, or nothing, you know. Yeah, it's nothing, and I mean, and, I mean, this is just shows you how socialist New Zealand is. I mean, if contraception is a value for you, and when you don't want to have a child, it is. Cough up your five bucks. I mean, it's not that difficult. Yeah. But, that's um, a, that, that's an academic argument that gets you headlines that Christopher Luxon ended up with. Mm-hmm. That oh, he's going to charge women for contraception. That's. I mean, here, where are his handlers saying, uh, that's a third rail, don't touch that? You know, he, like I said in my article on Thursday morning, he's doused himself in petrol and then he's gone dancing, strapped on ballet slippers and gone dancing on the third rail. You know, it, it's, he's, it's just stupidity. It's just an issue that you just don't need to talk about there's bigger things to talk you sideline it say no well status quo is where we're at on that da, 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 and move on to what you really want he to needs talk an about. earpiece so the person go well I don't answer that well he needs a brain <laughs> okay the, the, the problem with I mean I next level this, I picked this about uh, about Christopher Luxon a long time ago and I said he's got two ears and he's got one mouth and that's the ratio God intended you to use them right but he thinks he's got two ears and four mouths. And, and he's also, you know, to quote Father Ted, got five asses, and that's mostly where he speaks from. And no hair. Well, he's no. not going to get elected with no hair. <laughs> we, know about the, we know about the numbers on, on, on bald people being elected. They're only yeah. dictators, right? We've got to remember yeah, only that. dictators or they've won um, two ma- massive wars like Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yeah, there are a few exceptions. Marty, you got anything to say about... Well, Luxon's... Oh, you know, he couldn't it. have won with that. If he had have offered free contraception to beneficiaries, he would have been a eugenicist. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't, don't touch anything that uh, implies that you think women should take responsibility yes, in this election because that's what <laughs> Labor's fighting for, just doing it, being big daddy government. Nanny state. Nanny, did it, nanny did it, stage. Nanny, did it do him any stage. damage, though? Would that have done damage? Of course, oh, okay. death by a thousand cuts at the moment with Christopher right. Luxon. And, and okay. I saw a headline saying national. And Cam, you'd, you'd know this better than me from reading this article. You know, <laughs> we're, we're starting to acknowledge that it was a problem. Um, I don't know what options they've got to dig themselves out of it, though. Do, do they not sit down and say, "Okay, here's, let's look at this honestly. You did this, you did that. I mean, we, we really, you really can't do that anymore. You got to do this, you got to do that." Is someone there doing that? Well, they should be, but the problem is, is that um, under John Key, National became corporatized, and so they have the CEO mentality that um, you know it's all about the team. And when they say that, they really mean me. Uh, there's no I in team, but there's a me if you look really hard. And they want everyone to have this cult of personality, you know, and you look at, at Luxon's speeches, you know, so a national government that I lead. You know, when I see lines like that, it doesn't matter what political party, I'm, so, I'm sitting there going, this is all about you, isn't it? And he, he's trying to make that transition from business to politics, and he's failing badly at it. And John Key had six years to do to get ready for that. Um, Luxon's had barely three. So this, these are things that are, are given for people like me who have been in politics since we could crawl. Um, for someone like him, he's still thinking that he can issue orders and that there'll be somebody held accountable and um, and then they can blame them for that and I'll smell of roses still. And that doesn't work in politics. The buck mm-hmm. stops at the top. and doesn't matter if it's a staff member that um, has screwed up. Uh, you're still the fool that was in front of the camera. And that's what they've forgotten. I mean, when you're the CEO of Air New Zealand, hardly anybody ever sees you other than when you're glad handing the new uniform or the uh, fancy new biscuits that are being handed out. You know, they only do good stuff. They never a do new bad safety stuff. video. Yeah. 
Exactly. And they had that ad uh, where his various MPs were saying, he's got a plan, he's got a plan. And I just thought, you know, if they had have said, we've got a plan, I would have felt a whole lot better about it. Yeah, he's it, got a, it, I, I'm not hearing, I'm not seeing that plan. I'm not feeling the plan. It's to get back on track. Back, yeah. oh, back on where track. were you? You That's need to get back, back on the track. They're never going to live that one down. No. So how long has he got? To I mean, is there any way he can modify his approach, given there's no. probably still a bit of wiggle room time? No, I don't no. believe that he's got the wherewithal, the skills, or the ability to reverse a lifetime of talking crap. If and he was to appeal to anyone, who would it be? I, I don't know. Richard Preble in uh, this week's paper. Did you That's see what that? I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, he. I, I thought he had... Um, Bob Jones. A weird take on that. Yeah, well, he was on this program talking about that, and it was because he um, ditched the Maori Party. But you know who suggested that first? I did with Muriel Newman a month ago. They were listening. Yeah, they do listen. They. This is what people say to me. Why do? You, why are you constantly, you know, bagging the National Party on your website? Um, you know, we should be backing them. And I'm saying, well, no, I want better than that. Backing. You know, I, I want. Yeah, we should be backing them back on trick. I want them to be better. I want Christopher Luxon to be better. Yeah. And he's not. And in the sycophants, the blinkered blue rinse people with blue T-shirts and, you know. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. He's he's done great things in his business career. We need to vote for him because he's uh, not Christopher Hipkins. Uh, Sorry, that's not a reason to vote for somebody. There were no crashes while he was running the airline. How many crashes were there, you know, well, in the none. world? Three-fifths <laughs> like of five-eighths of stuff all. That's down to engineers anyway. Yeah. It's like uh, that joke, Cam, where the bird's freezing in a paddock and a cow comes and craps on him and he starts singing happily and warms up and then a cat drags him out and uh, eats him. And the moral of the story is not everyone who craps on you is your enemy and not everyone who pulls you out of the craps your friend. Yeah, but see, in the National Party, and, and it's the same in Labour. In fact, it's probably a bit more vicious in the, in the Labour Party. But in the National Party, if you don't toe the line um, and and tug your forelock, doff your cap, um, get down on bended knees and praise the leader, then you're considered a pariah. And um, and, and they tell you off, you know, I, I still get emails from you, oh, you know, I thought you were in that, you know, and you're bagging Luxon and you're this – they just seem to accept mediocrity, and I've never accepted mediocrity in my entire life, and I'm not about to start now. Olivia, what does he have to do to to hook the the, the women's vote? I wouldn't. I honestly wouldn't have a clue, Paul. It's I gave up on national a long, long even before John Key. So that's how okay, I'm asking disengaged I am from the whole party. Okay. I was always. Cam was always deeply loyal because of his background to the National Party, but, Cam, they have been mediocre for a long, yep. long time. That's all yep. we've had. Yeah, the, the, the thing with the National Party, you say, what can they do? You might think, oh, let's roll them. Well, the National Party will never do that because they are cowards. Ultimately, they're cowards. So they go down with the ship before they, you know, plug, plug the Look, lead. When, when Bill English was the leader t- twice and failed twice, they go, oh, no, he's still got the most votes, you know, in, two, in 2017. Well, he, is, was he the Prime Minister? Oh, no, no, that's right, he lost. It was Jacinda Ardern. So he lost. But the thing with the, the National Party is that the board and the management of it and the MPs, they are the ultimate status quo. That's why they never change anything that the Labour Party has ever done because – Oh, well, we don't we'll look at election year this year, so we don't want to rock the boat. You know, they, that's why it took them forever to get rid of Peter Goodfellow as the president, because they don't want to rock the boat. And then the next year... They never want to rock the boat. Exactly. They, they, they are the ultimate status quo party, and, and it means that they become moribund and boring. And so in election year, well, we can't rock the boat. And after the election, they go, oh, well, we did really well. We can't really replace the president or the leader now because, you know, he won the election. And then the next year they go, oh, well, you know, it's the middle year and it's not really the right cycle. And then the next year it's election year again and we get the same old shit. They don't want to rock the boat. I wonder what Stephen Joyce is making of this because, I mean, 
I mean, there's a smart man, and he's always been wedded to the National Party. I'm wondering what he's thinking about Luxon. I think he's tearing out the last remaining hairs that he has on his head. <laughs> well, his takes in the Herald, are, and I didn't catch one this weekend, but they're always razor sharp. And you think, well, it'd be good if maybe the National Party read them and they're not talking or because uh, they're pretty, you know, I mean, I think the week before last, he basically handed them their election, election campaign. But like, like I said, Christopher, Lu- Christopher Luxon has two ears and one mouth and he uses them in the reverse ratio. He'd mm. rather, he, he's like Jordan Williams and Nicola Willis and Chris Bishop, these people who've been through um, university and school debating teams and university debating teams. They are utterly convinced of their own brilliance and their own argument that they believe that if they can just talk at you for another 15 minutes, that you'll be convinced of their brilliance too. But we never are. I, I'd just like to see a bit of humility that comes across, you know, like. You know. You're asking narcissists, psychopaths and sociopaths <laughs> to have humility. There's always hope. No. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, balance that out. What's this Tanetti Hipkins delaying OIA to suit political agenda around? I think it's attendance, isn't it? Yeah, the attendance levels um, crash. There, there was an Official Information Act request um, asking for the attendance levels. Jan Tanetti um, was wanting to make some announcements around what they were going to do to arrest these appalling numbers. She had the numbers, of course, in advance. Uh, then uh, basically lied about uh, knowing that she had those, uh, released them several months late, um, and now it's come out that Chris Hipkins' office was uh, involved in the delays of those. And you know, this, this is the sad thing about it. We'll be the only people talking about this because uh, on the day that this information came to light, there was Christopher Luxon inserting uh, female contraceptives into his mouth followed by his feet. He could have made hay with that. He could make hay. Look, it's the target-rich environment with this ineptocracy that's leading us at the moment. You know, you, there's so many things that are wrong, and, you know, um, Christopher Luxon is not even getting close to hitting the ball out of the park. He's not even getting close to hitting the ball, and he keeps tripping over his own feet. And, you know, the, these things are bread and butter politics to whack them and all um, Christopher Luxon doing is doing is taking a baseball bat, handing it to Christopher Hipkins, and saying, "Bash me." <laughs> Without wanting to jinx anyone, Cam, who do you reckon would um, be better in, in that cabinet in that caucus in the, in the National Party? Mm. Well, I literally don't care. Like <laughs> everyone asks me this, and then they go, "Oh, Erica Stanford." Well, the Labour Party's just itching for Erica Stanford to take a position uh, in a, in a senior leadership position in the national. They're just begging for it. They're Why? hoping and praying. I'm not going to say that online on here. I don't want to get uh, you guys in trouble. Oh, so, okay. but but they, but let me tell you, they they are talking loudly, so loudly. At me sitting here in Takapuna, I can hear them talking about what they're going to do if Erica Stanford take uh, in a leadership position of the National Party. But I, I literally don't care because I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I'm a political commentator. I write things as I see them, and if I feel like talking about the National Party, I'll talk about the National Party. If I feel like talking about the Labour Party, I'll talk about the Labour Party. So if a politician does something stupid, I'm going to write about them. But do I care about um, the parties? Not one, Zach. And was, was there ever a time you did? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's the one thing that uh, Nicky Hager did a, a great favour to me is that he taught me the value of being apolitical or agnostic when it comes to politics. And, um, you know, I thank him for that, and I'm glad he wrote the book that he did, and it made me a better commentator. And he was trying to destroy me, and he actually made me better. And and so, Nikki, if he's if he's listening wow. to this, thanks That's... a lot, Nikki. You've um, really improved my life uh, uh, out of sight, and I'm a better political commentator because of it. I wonder if we should worry so much though about the um, absenteeism at school because of what they're teaching them there anyway. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, who wants your children to go to school? I, but but the story really is the fact that the OIA's 
there's a massive lag. They don't want any transparency on actually what the government's doing. But everyone seems to be done with democracy, you know. I mean, to even just talking about politics now, as we are doing, you seldom, we seldom actually get to discuss or partake in the exchange of ideas. It's not ideas. It's all little concrete bound points. Mantra. Mantra. Little distractions. Mayusha, yeah. It's like we're wandering in a train carriage and discussing which seat to sit in, but... Um, Back on track. The rails, yeah, let's get that back on track car. Yeah, without knowing where the train's going. Yeah, so the, 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 the direction of the rails is out of the control of uh, of your average voter. Yeah, it's politics used to be a debate of ideas, and sadly it's just a debate of, you know, silly, busy nothings. Well, yeah. well probably many people would um, uh, characterise what we're doing here as sort of kind of nasty, you know. Boo-hoo. Not your nice. Eyes. You know, these those the horrible... Talk to well, the head. Because we're critical. Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing people say, oh, you're so mean, Cam. You're so cruel. You know, it's like the the um the the woman who thinks she's a man who's upset at Unikim um, pharmacy um for saying something she wants a boycott. Right. You know, and the, the Herald runs a headline and says, Oh man disgusted at Waves Tread. And I just tweeted, sorry, sweetie, you're not a man. Well, you should have seen the vitriol that descended on me. I mean, of course I did it on purpose, but um, it's just insane. It, that yeah. We're supposed to believe this rubbish, you know? Yeah, it's very difficult when everything's this insane and absurd. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, many of us do actually care about the ideas and we, you know, we have a, a love for this country and we're patriots and we have a vested interest in the future for the next generations and all that, um, yet... Um, the major issues of our time do not get properly discussed. They don't get debated. I mean, where do you go to hear a debate anymore? Yeah. No, no, we're not allowed to debate. You know, you, if you say something about Maori in any way, that's not the approved version or um, you know, agreed talking points. You're a racist. Um, you're a colonialist. Or yes, they're really designed or to shut down debate, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and and what they're really saying is shut up. Oh, and, yeah. and it's the same with, the, you know, the Posey Parker debate. I mean, I, I've listened to what she's got to say, and she's a bit shrill, and I find it annoying. But she can, she can be annoying. That's the thing. You're allowed to be annoying. Not that annoying. Oh, she's Not, fabulous. But if, well, if what's you're fabulous is that she unhinges these fruit loops um, who think they're women, and they actually use violence and the left is terrible. I mean, that was what Nikki Hager's entire premise of dirty politics was to try and shut me up because I was effective. And um, that's their entire strategy all the time. It is to shut people up who are effective voices, talking sense and debating issues. And they don't want the, deba the issues debated. They want you to shut up. Yeah, you know, why, why don't... Why doesn't anyone in the media, why doesn't politicians say, well, thank you for that comment about that, but um, you know what? You're crazy. You, it is, you're just wrong. Just and most people away. would go, oh, at last, at last. Oh, <laughs> someone actually said it. I'll be <laughs> waiting for that. So no comeback um, despite this OIA thing and people covering it up and Hipkins' office uh, pulling it back or whatever. It's not going to be reported, so... It, it, no way ever um, is equivalent to the Luxon thing. No, well, they what's cancel each is, other out or anything like that? But Jan Tanetti's been reported to the Privileges Committee. If you ever look at the makeup of the Privileges Committee, it's stacked with Labour MPs. So nothing's going to happen there. Um, Hipkins will just ignore it. The media are a lock for the Labour Party, and you've seen that, you know, it constantly today. You know, they're fact checking the Labour soft on crime, all oh, the surprising statistics that show they're not, you know, despite, um, you know, rampant street crime and ram raids and violence occurring in walls and shops all around the country. Oh, no, we're just imagining that, uh, you know, the police minister's still gaslighting us and, you know, Jenny Anderson's got to get an honourable mention because she was the gaslighter of the week last week. She can't win it this week, but we can give her an honourable mention for it. Okay. All right, moving on. At last I'm seeing the WHO come up in things. Is Winston starting to wake up to the bigger picture? Well, at least I'm glad we've got one politician out there who 
is highlighting exactly what's going on at the WHO. Um, I mean, really, when you, I've been combing through those, any documents that um, give us information on what they're planning. And really, if New Zealand signs on to this, we're done. We're totally done because um, it's such a smacking of our freedoms. And that, um, that piece that was in stuff, um, Katie Kenny titled No, The Who Isn't About to Deprive New Zealand of Its Sovereignty. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. And, I mean, you know, I've been, what's his name, beautiful, love him to pieces, Leighton Smith on his podcast, mm. had on Dr. David Bell, who's a senior scholar at Brownstone. Oh, Institute. no, I had him too. Yeah, he's really cool. Oh, been, I missed that, Paul. Yeah, he's he's been it. down in the who for a long time. He's seen it from the inside. So yeah. he knows what he's talking about. Um, but, I mean, basically he lays out that the proposed um, international health regulations, which are the amendments, reverse the whole understanding of having to work within the framework of the Universal Human Rights Declaration. They've taken it out. Yeah, so for instance, where it reads in Article 3 under principles, the implement implementation of these regulations shall be with full respect for the dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms of persons. There's now a big line through that phrase and it now reads, the implementation of these regulations shall be based on the principles of equity, inclusivity mm -hmm. and coherence. So, I mean, that is completely... Don't even know what it means. Well, I mean, yeah, well, nobody does. Equity, inclusivity and coherence means whatever they want it to mean. But the underlying equality of individuals is removed and the rights become subject to a status that's determined by others based on a set of criteria that those others get to define. Um, he goes on and says states will accept the WHO as the authority in international public health emergencies, elevating it above their own ministries of health. Well, I mean... Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. I mean, we've actually lived through this because this is what we got under COVID. We know that um, Jacinda was sort of, you know, saluting all the time the overseas supernatural supernatural bodies. Um, but it, it's absolutely chilling. And, of course, um, David Bell also mentions that, unsurprisingly, um, to observers of the COVID-19 response... These proposed restrictions um, on individual rights under the DG's discretion include freedom of speech. The WHO will have the power to designate opinions or information as misinformation or disinformation and require country governments to intervene and stop such expressions and dissemination of ideas they don't like. Um, this will run up against um, national constitutions like the US Constitution, um, but will be a boon to dictators and one-party regimes. Um, and it's, of course, as we've said, incompatible with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But these are no longer considered the guiding principles for the WHO. So if they're not going with, if they're not guiding principles anymore, you know, those little pesky things called human rights, mm. this is full-blown dictatorship. And, of course, it's not just health. That's how they're going to sell it. They are hugely involved in climate change and health-related issues to climate change, whatever they are. Um, so it's chilling all around. Okay. Can I be a conspiracy theorist for a moment? I want to see what you think about this. There's that RFP for what the disinformation project do. It's kind of written for them. So there's that. We found out about that last week, and that's only for three weeks that runs, and then, then they do the work. The Free Speech Union leaked supposedly embargo documents which were released anyway uh, which talks about the new censorship regime let's say so there's that and then there's this it's all coming together quite nicely isn't it well i don't think it's a conspiracy you know we talked about this you know um, i think two weeks ago when we said the difference between a conspiracy theory and fact is three weeks and it's running at about that it was yeah, two weeks it, actually two weeks you know there are conspiracies i'm sorry there's conspiracy theories, but there are real conspiracies. They go on all the time. I don't know why people. But, the, but these are all the bits you have need. Have an aversion to the term conspiracies. These are all the piece parts you need to make all this work. But, but yet, yeah, the reason why they call us conspiracy theorists, or con is that you know we believe in these conspiracies, it's uh, going back to that same argument. What we're going to do is 
We're going to deride those people. We're going to other them. We're going to silence them by ridiculing them. These are This is all the playbook that Josef Goebbels wrote that Adolf Hitler imposed. And, and you know, some of this who stuff, when you read it, you know, you know we were discussing this yesterday, um, Olivia, it reads like the 1C conference. It does read like the 1C conference. You know, you know and where they all get together and create this corporate vision um, that we're going to do all of these things. And countries like New Zealand that don't have a written, written constitution where human rights are abrogated on a seemingly daily basis by the police, by the um, government. We saw this with the with the mandates. With you know, We've yeah. got a Bill of Rights Act that's toothless and meaningless. And when you actually said, no, no, actually, you know, I've got a right to refuse that. And they said, well, well that's good, but you're not going to have a job. Tough shit. Um, those human rights were trampled by the government. Uh, the media joined in um, parroting their lines and walloping anybody who stood up for those human rights. And the police um, showed that their respect for the law is scant at best. And it, we, the pandemic showed us that it doesn't take very long to move us to a totalitarian environment where people who speak up are silenced and abused and demonized and segregated. And, and, um, and it, it, it just carries on like that until somebody actually does something about it. But unfortunately, Kiwis are so laid back. They're, they're, well, they wouldn't horizontal. do anything like that to us, would they? Of course no, they, they would. They did. They, would, they, they did they do would. it to us. Well, I know they did, but that's what p- people kind of think. You know, they wouldn't do that to us, did would you, they? Did you catch that interview uh, James Corbett did with RFK Jr., where, and it's in his book as well, they drilled uh, these... Um, a pandemic multiple times, CIA, um, all of these different uh, bodies. And the drills were, were not about how to manage health so much as how to um, take control of the media and uh, pivot all these Western democracies into authoritarian regimes. Um, so, I mean... Well, they did it, didn't they? they they've done it. And and I think that's that's the hardest thing is seeing those different niches in humanity that have been covered up with affluence. And, you know, the people who burn witches at the stake are still right there. The the witch finder generals are still there. Uh, And and it runs uh, on euphemisms. You know, there's euphemisms for everything that's ugly and uh, inhumane. Um, I mean, every time we stood up during the COVID pandemic for our Bill of Rights or made noises about it, we, we, the response was always, oh, so you're perfectly okay with killing grandma. You think they really believe that, though, and, and, and putting that up as a, as a kind of a mission statement? To, that's just a way to get people again to do what you imply. want. Well, yeah, they knew that too. I mean, then um, Kirsten Murphitt wrote uh, Submission to Parliament. This is, um, she's the uh, Democracy NZ candidate for Tauranga. I, I, I know personally very, just studious lady and does dots her eyes and crosses her t's. Yes, smart lady. Yeah, smart. And um, yeah, they 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 knew even as they were doing the two shots for summer that uh, and that it didn't stop transmission. That the best way to get people to take it was to say it was going to stop transmission. Which we know right. it was, was a lie. It was a, a lie. lie. They knew it's they were lying, lie. even as they said it. Pfizer well, knew they were lying. At the One Z yeah. conference, at the One Z conference, which was what um, Reinhard Heydrich, Adolf Eichmann, Wilhelm Helm Stuckart, who wrote all the Nuremberg race laws, you know those kinds of men, getting together and drinking champagne and eating canapes as they talked about the final solution in very civilized tones. Of course, they kept talking about um, evacuation, the evacuation of Jews from Europe. That was the euphemism, but of course it meant extermination. And even Stuckart, who wrote the Nuremberg race laws, had an issue about just exterminating women and children. He wanted them sterilized. He wanted Jews sterilized. Um, you know, and he basically made a, a bit of a plea down that line because he felt that you would end Jews in Europe if you could just sterilize them and then do it by the law, because of course that altered the laws to not include Jews anymore. And Heydrich turned around and said, 
Um, we will not sterilize every Jew and wait for them to die. We will not sterilize every Jew and then exterminate the race. That's farcical. Dead men don't hump. Dead women don't get pregnant. Death is the most reliable form of sterilization. Put it that way. Wow. Yeah. Dear. Look, this must be Winston's opportunity. Cam, well, you can speak to this probably. Yeah, I think, I think Winston's... Um, poised to to launch he's he's of course not going to do what david seymour is doing um directly attacking the national party david seymour can't attract any votes off labor or the greens so he has to attack the national party um but the problem with david seymour's strategy is it doesn't grow the pie winston can, has got a viable strategy to play the center um, or, in fact, he's probably centre-right, given how left-wing Luxon has taken the National Party. So he can actually still appeal, though, to those centre voters in uh, that voted Labour at the last election who are looking at Christopher Luxon and going, sorry. And there's a whole lot of women out there who would look at Winston and go, well, he's got a full head of hair, snappy suits, um, dresses really well. Oh, he's definitely um, an old, a handsome old fox. Devil. Yeah, he's a sil you know, the silver fox. Um, yeah. And they'll say, oh, you know, he's a bit of a rascal and a scallywag. But, you know, the oh. things he's saying, you know, I I agree with that. You know, he's he's attacking this woke stuff, you know, and, and, he, and all Winston has to do is ride that woke wave all the way to the election and we could be looking at an upset. Uh, how big of an upset, potentially? Well, Is right now he's sitting at about three and a half to four and a half the campaign hasn't got started. A traditional election campaign would see him, you know, move over that 5%. But National's just not firing. And we're seeing that in the polls. They're just static. There's not, they're not growing that, um, that, that list of that vote. Um, you know, ACT is doing incredibly stupid things at the moment, poaching MPs, uh, coming out with a whole lot of cockamamie statements. Um, David Seymour just looks supercilious and lightweight. No one's interested, mate. No one cares, mate. No one cares, no one cares about, you, mate. about you. Yeah, and yeah, it's just dismissive. Um, he, he, you know, he he's an awful politician, really, and he's he's another one of these people who's so convinced of his own brilliance and that he's the smartest man in the room. Oh, he doesn't, but he doesn't realise that he's the only man in the room. Where did he get those um, elderly women bodyguards from? No idea. I know the ones you mean. The <laughs> Get away. Stop it. Get away. Oh, Get away. That was awful. I thought we were going to give Seymour gaslighter of the Oh, yeah. I, I, I yeah. Think it's on. It's on. Well, it's let's on. do that now. Should we award it now? Since we, we mentioned it. We've oh, okay. surprise now, Olivia. <laughs> I don't want those women coming sorry, around in my house, did though. I ruin it. Probably typical. <laughs> those women um, reminded me of the Harry Enfield ladies, you know. Young man. Young, young man. man. Come inside, young man. I'll show I you mean, the gas I mean, they were serious, <laughs> serious um, uh, hearing, uh, you know, uh, threat. I uh, love just Harry. the tone, the tone and the. Look, like I mean, Seymour's come out with of, this article, right, that he that was published on the platform. This is he's so desperate to win the freedom vote, or at least you know, milk votes from there. Um, we see him. We see him. We Olivia. see him, and he goes a year after the violent breakup of the anti-mandate protests. There is a long tale of division and resentment. The easy answer is to dismiss the protest, judging it by its worst members. That would that would ignore many other discontented but peaceful New Zealanders who were there and those who supported him. But at the protest, remember that he was saying things like. There's no political benefit in appealing to that group of people outside Parliament. It is a couple of hundred voters no one wants. He was Whoa. more than a couple the of hundred the days I was there. It was yeah, the well. Me too. But and and you know, calling us crazies and stragglers and pro. This, this is this and, this is the same guy who said suggested that buses go around door to door, dragging people out and injecting them. Yeah. And he, you know, he likes to boast at the moment that he didn't um, vote for the COVID-19 Emergency Act. Um, and then he goes and made all those suggestions about telling un um, tell unvaccinated frontline MIQ staff, if they haven't got the jab by this Sunday, don't come in on Monday. And then, and then he, he makes this spurious, he constantly makes this claim that I was speaking to the leaders of the protest. Of the organisation. Of the organisation. Bullshit. Yeah. David, you're gaslighting us. That's why you're gaslighter of the week this week. 
Do we have an actual physical award that we can send through? I think we should get one. I mean, how do we like a little fart badge in a or jar? Something. Well, you know, it should be just a little AG jar, like you know, a gaslight fart in a jar, because that's what he is. <laughs> and and you know, he he never met any of the leaders. You know how I know that? Because I know who they are, and they didn't meet him. No, he didn't meet with organizers. That's a lie. Oh. He yeah. he met with one Fruit Loop, who is the sole pro whaling lobbyist in New Zealand, who is quite strange, and uh, a couple of his cronies uh, in back benches, and everyone else ca- carried on uh, working around him. There was certainly nobody there from um, the Freedom and Rights Coalition. There was nobody there from Voices for Freedom. No, There's no Leighton no, Baker. No Leighton Baker. He met with no one of any import. That thing that you read out, Olivia, that, that sounds like desperation to me. Desperation's a stinky yeah, cologne. Because, because I mean, he, he, he's really making the case that he was this great bridge between the um, protesters and, and, no, wasn't. And, and Parliament. Yeah, I know. He, he goes on and says, but the overall majority of protesters were peaceful people who were simply and justifiably hurt. Yeah, but, but the schoolgirls couldn't get down the street. No one could get into the office building and you couldn't find a park. Yeah, that's well, he, bollocks he sure because, as hell wasn't saying anything that nice about us. At the but that's bollocks because when I was there, the schoolgirls were wandering through the whole no, thing. And nobody apparently they came anything. for the food. I was told they came and for that, the food. And, and I remember sitting with a whole bunch of uh, Maoris and hippies and down, down, and the girls were on their way to school wearing their masks and the guys they weren't being mean to them. They would say, hey, I can't see your pretty smile under your mask. And you'd see these girls, you know, um, you could see underneath they were actually smiling at the comment um, and a little bit shy, but they were. it was done kindly, it was done sweetly, it was done humanely, any kind of heckling that went on about masks. It okay. was, it was yeah. a it well-organised protest. There was even, if you dropped a piece of paper, a lolly paper or a cigarette butt, somebody would say, hey, hey, could you pick that up, please? Oh, please yeah. Please. There's a bin over there. It was well organised. The only time that it turned into carnage was when the police turned up intent on violence. And nobody oh, yeah. has said that. Nobody in, in the media said, well, actually, they were peaceful until the police turned up. Then the police started whacking people. And then and the police started smashing their laptops, ripping out their tents. But, I mean, I don't, I don't know what about you, but if someone's going to smash my laptop, I'm going to get very upset. Yeah. But very the upset. The disappeared real quick was that the police had used those area denial weapons, you know, whether it was... Um, yeah, the uh, LRAD or whatever they're called. Yeah. Yeah, Sonic. You, you never Sonic. heard anything more about that. But here's the other they thing. They did like, do it. They, during- they admitted they used them. You remember the claims that were issued constantly? You know, oh, the the police have had acid thrown in their face. Uh, oh. Next minute, there's the video of the police sergeant spraying his own people spraying his by, own mis- with by mistake with pepper spray. Right? Then there was, oh no, they've got pitchforks. Yeah, you know, there's weapons. Well, they trashed that whole place. Right? Where was the? You know, when the police raid a gang pad and a drug house. They line up all the cash and all the drugs and all the guns and all the ammunition. They publish all these photos of these. Look what we discovered. Did you see any of that after that? Pro- Where was the pitchfork? Did that just miraculously disappear up a policeman's ass? And and they you know? blasted Chantel in the face with a fire extinguisher. Yeah, how's that? Yeah. That's on camera. Toxic. That that's toxic crap. No yeah, police officer is- has been charged. Have you ever seen the police turn up to a gang pad? Uh- so armed as they did to that group of uh, protesting Never. Kiwis. Never, you know, and and they were deploying, you know, um, actually grenade launchers, right? They had grenade launchers, the H and K grenade launchers what? that they bought. Yeah, that's how you. Fl- they call them sponge rounds, right? Those oh, sponge rounds. That's a are, euphemism. They yeah. are hard yeah. plastic. They're solid plastic. They hurt, but they're delivered out of a grenade launcher. And the grenade launcher the police own, and they've got plenty of, I know, because I've got an OIA that tells me how many they've got, is a 40 millimeter grenade launcher, standard military equipment. And they were deploying those and and shooting people with these sponge rounds. And they really hurt those things too. When they should get into dairy owners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so gas, solve it. gas lighter of the week. Gas lighter of the week has to be David Seymour. And, and Jenny I'm, Anderson, an honourable mention. And the next week, I'm going to look into how we can get a physical award made up. 
Yeah, and we should just start sending them to and them. We'll we send can probably them get the, I tell you what we could do, we'd probably find some awards on AliExpress or something for yeah. a dollar because that's about but, all they're worth. Pam, yeah. what about um, on Paul's show? Lindsay did his um, Perigo Perspectives and Will Ryan got visited by the police and they told him to leave Seymour alone. Honestly. Well, apparently I, they met up in a restaurant and uh, and according to Lindsay, I only, I only know what Lindsay said, uh, you know, that was a, a coincidence. Yeah, no, Will but, told me that. It was a coincidence. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Auckland is not a big city. It's a tiny city, and yeah. there are only so many restaurants in Ponsonby and and um, and Epsom. But, um, no, it was a – and Will wouldn't lie about that. Um, but Seymour obviously got the cops to pay him a visit and tell him not to – and I'm sorry, he's running for office. We are allowed to go – Along to any public speech, he makes. no one cares, mate. Him. No one cares. You know, no one cares. No one cares get, about you, mate. Get back on track, away, David. Go away. This get back on track. Everyone seems to be done with democracy, but you know, you used to be able to heckle a politician um, and get a better response than the police showing up at your door. This is just you have, you haven't earned you haven't earned your political creds if you haven't been to a a, 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 a Labour Party meeting and Eden electorate in the. 80s and got yourself bashed for heckling. You know, you haven't lived unless you, that's happened. You know, you learn that you learn how to heckle at, at meetings. And, you know, what Will Ryan was doing at that meeting when he was going, yeah, you know, no one cares, no one cares. That, that's just childish. But, but also, he didn't, he didn't seem too was, aggressive. Li- no, he was not aggressive. I mean, if that's aggressive, you should well, he wasn't aggressive come at all. hang out. With, he, I don't think he was aggressive at all. Um, he was assertive um, and yeah, calm. Assertive. And and he use uh, and he uh, speaks beautifully. His question was well formulated. It was a question we all wanted an answer on. Actually, um, I think Will did a great public service and showing up to that um, pickle David at that. Um, okay, uh, time is a little tight, so we've got to really spool through the next yeah. ones real quick to wind it up. So um, Simon Wilson um, busted for lying about Luxon's North Shore meeting and getting fact checked. The fact checker. Gets fact um, checked. He's just a nasty little communist, isn't he? he? He just makes stuff up to suit his political agenda, publishes it in the Herald, gets fact checked. Um, you know, someone actually produced a video and audio of the meeting, proven to be a lie. That the Herald, to their credit, and I, I really struggled to say that, but they actually <laughs> they actually corrected the article and put a little rider at the top of it. Um, but you know, Simon Wilson's. Uh, political prognostications are appalling. And, you know, if he says something, if you take the opposite of that, you'll probably be right. You know, he was predicting a landslide for whoever stood against Wayne Brown, whatever his name was, from South Auckland. And, Collins. Oh, oh, that's right, him. You know, and um, and he just got cleaned out and, and the left wing got cleaned out. And that's because these people have an agenda. They're not actually journalists. They're not actually reporters. They have an agenda, and their agenda is to um, screw up conservatives, and they live by that. So, yeah, it was good to see him get his comeuppance. All right, and to finish up on, uh, Palmjeet Palmer switches to act. Well, I've only got one thing to say about that. The National Party has been very, very quiet for a good reason. They're glad to see the back of her. Marty? No, I, I – yeah, I, I don't – I think we just need – we need uh, a clean out. Yeah, we need a clean out. And, and uh, you know what we sort of alluded to before about, um, you know, be good not just to be uh, talking about what's wrong or talking about what's in the news, but talking about, well, what would New Zealand look like ideally? And because you never see those, uh, those conversations. And no, um, you never see them. You mean the reason that I think it's easier to sound nasty is because there are real impacts on saying an education system's world class mm-hmm. when it's uh, you know fifty five percent of kids who get through it are enumerate and illiterate, you know those kids some a lot of those kids are going to jail they're having bad outcomes for their kids, these people who are um, sitting in there and uh, pretending that you know it's all an accident are uh, evil and it's the banality of evil we you oh, know we keep yeah. coming back to mm-hmm. yeah we do. All right, well, there goes another one. Is you know it- what it is, Marty? It's, oh. it's lying as a way of life, you know? I mean, we know politicians lie and or get caught. Show, me one, show me one who doesn't. 
Yeah, but now it's become this entrenched lying as a way of life and building yeah. careers around it, and it's so it's just awful to watch. You, you look at Jacinda Ardern, she started her political career as Prime Minister by saying that she's never told a lie in yeah. politics. Well, that was a lie. Oh, that was a lie. <laughs> That was the fir- that was the first one that we double down, double down. <laughs> All right, there goes another one, um, longish again, but fun and I think entertaining and informative. I want to thank Cam Slater, Olivia Pearson, and Marty Gibson again for being part of our panel. I'll get that award made up. I'll probably send out a few options for consultation on design, and we can sort of have a you know some sort of consensus on that, and then we'll start sending them out through the mail. To the, ga- to the gas lit. <laughs> the gas- well, thank you, Paul, again. I'll, I'll deliver them in person. I'd love oh, that'd to. that'd be great. There. You're going to have to film that, though. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And we can run little snippets, gas lighter of the year. Yeah, the and you can, you can present them like, you know, the, an awards ceremony type thing. I'll go and look at with Elliot's an place and see if I can find an award with a cigarette lighter or something like that on it. Yeah, something, something gassy. What about a noose? <laughs> Ooh, a nurse? <laughs> <laughs> is it a nurse or a noose? A noose. No, okay. it's a nu- no, it's a nurse. It's like you know the nurse that's going to get everyone back on track. A be back on track. And on that note, we'll say goodbye. Have a great weekend, everybody, and uh, we'll talk again next Friday here at RCR. Okay, All right. Bye. RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio.